We're going to begin back in Syria, where opposition activists and groups, aid groups, say at least 40 people were killed in a suspected <clears throat> chemical weapons attack over the weekend. The alleged attack took place late Saturday in Douma, the last rebel-held enclave in eastern Ghouta near the capital of Damascus. Video coming out of the region shows people being hosed off with water. Local activists tell NBC News they saw dozens of dead bodies, many of whom were children, in underground shelters across the city. According to a statement from Syrian Civil Defense and the Syrian American Medical Society, the reported symptoms indicate that the victims suffocated from exposure to toxic chemicals. Both the Syrian and Russian governments are denying involvement. The Syrian government called the allegations of a chemical attack fabrications. Today, the UN Security Council is ex expected to hold an emergency meeting to discuss the reported chemical attack. Meanwhile, a pre-dawn missile strike hit an air base in central Syria overnight. According to the Associated Press, Russia and the Syrian military are blaming Israel for the strike, saying Israeli fighter jets launched the missiles from Lebanon's airspace. A war monitoring group said the airstrikes killed 14 people. Israel's foreign ministry had no comment when asked about the accusations. Admiral Stravitas, um, obviously the United States has much to answer for in the lead up to the Iraq war in 2003 uh, and for, for much of, of the chaos that was let loose in that region. But the, the further we get away from uh, the United States and the Obama administration encouraging uh, resistance against Assad, and then the United States sitting back and doing little to nothing while 500, 600,000 people die, and, uh, and watching one red line after another be run through, and now having another president wanting to abandon that region. Um, I mean, how, how are historians going to look back on the United States involvement and lack thereof in Syria and the, the international refugee crisis that it let loose and the chaos and the hell that we just absolutely refuse to step up and, and, and assist in, in bringing to, to resolution. Joe, I think uh, future historians will look back and unload a great deal of shame on all of us, and they should. I mean, this is beginning to feel like uh, Rwanda, for example, where we watched this train wreck almost in slow motion go on and on and on. <clears throat> Let me tell you what's happening in the Pentagon today. Uh, all night, the J3, the Directorate for Operations, has been building options for the president. The J5, the Directorate for Plans and Policies, is working on the connectivity internationally. And what we got to do is kind of get the interagency together, Joe. So this is John Bolton's big day, and he, his job as the National Security Advisor is to bring state and, and defense together along with the national security team to make decisions about are we going to move the carriers. Our carriers are mispositioned right now, for example. We're going to have to look at are we going to give the president options for land-based strikes? Are we going to use special forces? Will cyber be incorporated? Will Israel be part of this? France has already indicated a desire to help. The bottom line is we have to take action. This is unconscionable what is unfolding in front of us. And, and, and Richard, the United States policy has been so erratic. It's been schizophrenic. We go into Iraq in 2003 in an unjustifiable war. We stay there. We stay the course. We finally bring some semblance of order to the region by 2008, 2009. We then abandon it in 2011. We allow the rise of ISIS in 2012, 2013. We belatedly start going in there, crush ISIS. Uh, and now we have another United States president that once again, in a schizophrenic move, now that we have created a successful and a sustainable model to actually keep peace in that region, we now have a president, a commander in chief, that says to the generals, good job, 
but I'm going to do just what Barack Obama did in 2011. We're bringing everybody home because it feels good to me. It feels good to Donald Trump to say, I'm going to bring the troops home. And yet, chaos is loosened upon the world. So here's what Donald Trump has to think about. One is, going to exactly your point, Joe, does he find a way to walk away from this uh, quasi-isolationist desire to, quote-unquote, bring the troops back home and to move away from the one group that has worked with us and fought valiantly and effectively against ISIS, which are the Syrian Kurds. So that's issue one. Do we keep a modest presence there open-ended? Obviously, we should. Issue two. Do we respond to Syrian use of chemical weapons, which flouts an international norm? I would say we have to. Ish and we have to do it bigger than last time. Shooting off a couple of cruise missiles may make us feel good. It doesn't accomplish any good. Thirdly, do we commit ourselves to getting rid of Assad? And there, I think you could argue, that's still a bridge too far. That's far right now. That's but do, do we commit ourselves to taking the eastern part of Syria and doing what many people have suggested for some time and create a no-fly zone and a safe zone for refugees to return home? Clearly, that's the sort of thing that we need to think. We've got the Syrian Kurds we're working with. Do we create some kind of a humanitarian zone? Do we basically say, okay, for now, Assad is the mayor of greater Damascus. Right. We don't like it. We we can't stop it. He's there. But, 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 we are going to create a part of Syria that the Syrian people can leave safe, live safely in. Even some can return to. People, you're right. More than what? More than 60 percent of this country is now displaced, either internally or has been turned into refugees. The question is, do we begin to take back parts and, of Syria? And Richard explained it's important. Yesterday, front page of the New York Times. And then if you look at Fred Hyatt's editorial in the Washington Post, you see the same themes. There is a battle against democracy. What has caused that battle in Europe for democracy? A refugee crisis that these countries have been unable uh, to, to confront. And that, in part, was let loose again by the lack of action in Syria. If there is still a United Nations, and if that United Nations has any teeth and any purpose for existing, would it not be to create a safe zone, a no-fly zone in eastern Syria to allow these refugees to return home? The UN, I do not believe, will green light that because people, countries like Russia have vetoes. So this is a little bit like Bosnia. If there's, and Jim Stavri, Admiral Stavridis knows this better than anybody, if there's going to be some type of concerted international action, my guess is you'll have to do an end run around the United Nations, possibly do it through NATO, and the United States and some like-minded countries in Europe and in the region will have to work together. Because there isn't a United Nations, Joe. There isn't an international consensus about what should be done in and situations why do we have like it? this. But still, look, it can be a useful talk shop. And as you saw, for example, after Saddam invaded Kuwait, in certain limited areas, the world is able and willing to come together. But great powers increasingly are disagreeing. We are returning to an era of international relations where the idea that the major powers line up is increasingly not happening. And that's what we're seeing on Syria. So Thanks for checking out MSNBC on YouTube. And make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. And you can click on any of the videos around us to watch more for Morning Joe and MSNBC. Thanks so much for watching.